I'm Ryan Landrosif. Welcome to Let's Think Digital. What is state capacity? Well, at its most basic, it asks the question, can government do the things that it says it's going to do? It's really all about implementation or what we sometimes call delivery. And in my experience, one of the hardest things that public servants have to do is implement. Sure, we can have as many policies and vision statements and strategies as we want. We can have the greatest ideas in the world, but if you can't deliver on them, then frankly, they aren't worth the piece of paper that they're written on. In the digital era, that ideal of good implementation means being able to deliver digitally. And when we think about state capacity in that context, too often these days we find our institutions coming up short. That's why I'm so excited to bring you my interview today with Jennifer Polka. Jennifer has a long history as a leading figure in the digital government movement south of the border. She served as Deputy Chief Technology Officer for the U.S. government under President Obama's administration, where she helped to create the United States Digital Service. She's also the founder and former Executive Director of Code for America, which she led for 10 years. More recently, she co-founded and is chair of the board of directors for the United States Digital Response, which is a new organization that was set up to help governments respond to the COVID-19 crisis through mobilizing volunteer tech talent. She's also the author of a new book called Recoding America, which draws from her incredible experience and expertise to talk about the fundamental things that need to change in government if we're gonna address the big issues of the day, whether that's recovering from the pandemic, decarbonizing our infrastructure and economy, or responding to a rapidly realigning geopolitical environment. Her book is all about implementation and how to deliver on digital. So in my conversation with her, we talk a lot about why governments seem to find themselves in a crisis of implementation and delivery, regardless of partisan strength. But we also talk about ways to get unstuck, stay motivated, and a really heartwarming end to the interview where Jennifer talks about what to do when we are feeling demoralized and the change is never going to come. This is our second interview we're bringing to you from our on-site podcast recording booth at the Forward 50 conference that took place in November. If you missed our previous interview with Sean Boots and his call to action on how to create a modern government up to the challenges of the digital era, I really encourage you to go back and listen to that episode. Please be sure as well to follow and subscribe to Let's Think Digital on your favorite podcast app and on our YouTube channel so that you're always notified when new episodes drop. But for now, let's get into my conversation with Jennifer Polka. Welcome, Jennifer. Great to have you on Let's Think Digital. Thank you for having me. Uh, super excited to be here with Jennifer Polka. We're at the Forward 50 Conference in Ottawa. Welcome to Canada. Welcome to Ottawa. Um, Thank and, you. You know, and thrilled to dive in. I mean, Jennifer, you are, you've been a leader in technology in the government space for many, many years. You've worked inside the U.S. government. You helped to set up Code for America, a large civic tech organization down in the States. Um, and one of the things most recently you've done is write this wonderful book, Recoding America, uh, uh, which has been a great read and I know has caused a lot of buzz in the digital government community in the last year. Uh, you had a really fascinating talk this morning in Forward 50. And I you know, want to just maybe start, have you share a little bit about what your journey has been in this space and you know how you got involved in this intersection between better mm -hmm. government and technology? Thank you. Yeah, it has been quite a journey. Uh, and I think that journey has been one of a lot of learning for me. When I got involved, um, you know, with this Gov 2.0 events back in, what was that, 2008, 2009, yep. um, you know, it was obvious to me, having spent some time then in D.C. and other places, sort of learning what, how, how they were approaching digital um, and being able to contrast that with the world I had come from, which was the Web 2.0 world, the contrast was rather stark. <laughs> Um, but, I, you know, the original idea of Code for America was sort of, oh, tech can help government. And, and I think part of my journey over those years has been, oh, it's a very much a two-way street. Um, and we have so much to learn in the tech world about policy, about democracy, 
Uh, and we have so much, not just sort of knowledge to learn, but I think sensitivities to develop and appreciation for government. So I think that's probably been the most um, defining characteristic of sort of my arc. Um, you know, going leaving Code for America three years ago, having a chance to reflect on on all of that and and sort of write down kind of uh, the the lessons of it. You know, I've really landed now on the frame of state capacity is mm -hmm. what I want to work on. And it's not because I don't care about digital. I still think digital has so much. Uh, to do with how the public actually experiences government. It's absolutely critical. But this idea of state capacity, which is just, you know, can government do what it says it's going to do? Can yeah. we achieve our policy goals? Really gets at sort of these fundamental uh, core competencies of government, like hiring and funding and oversight and sort of the proceduralism, and says we're going to have to work on those in order to create a different environment in which digital teams can succeed. So I'm kind of, I guess, you know, uh, going upstream to, yep. to uh, echo the theme that Alistair started out with this morning at the, at the conference. Yeah, and you know, you talked about this divide between policy and implementation or policy and delivery in your talk this morning. And I mean, my experience here in Canada, at least, and I'd be curious your experience in the US, is that within government, policy is kind of treated at, you know, the top of the hierarchy of disciplines, right? Yes. You know, there's not a lot of love given to the folks who are doing the operational roles. Yeah. But it leads, I mean, particularly when we're talking about federal government that tends not to be as connected with mm -hmm. people on the ground, you get policy people who are very disconnected from the realities of what's happening. Is that the same experience you've had in the U.S.? Is that disconnect between you know, kind of the policy, the policy disciplines are in some ways more valued, but they lose the ability to actually have real impact on the ground. I think, yes, 100%. Um, I think we have a sort of class structure in government that we inherited from the British who have a clear distinction between <laughs> the intellectuals, as <laughs> they say, and the mechanicals. And the <laughs> intellectuals are the policymakers and the mechanicals are the people who do operations and delivery. They're and um, we really would do ourselves a great favor to uh, really knock down those barriers and and sort of shed shed that old way of thinking. Um, you know, we look at the world around us today. The stuff that really works was built bottom up. Uh -huh. It was built from first and foremost understanding what people need and how to get that to them. You know, possibly you could say in the consumer world, we've gone to more towards what people want, right. <laughs> what, not what people need. But that's the special sauce of government is that we are about what people need and giving it to them. But um, we really have to start valuing that bottom up look and a bottom up strategy and uh, and and getting rid of the not just the certainly the silos but also this sort of divide between mm -hmm. the thinkers and the doers. It's not a helpful divide. <laughs> we can only yep. think now in the context of doing. Yeah, yeah, and, and that notion of making being a doer a valuable thing yeah. that helps you in your career, that, that has a spotlight put on it. So I'm actually, I'm curious, you know, you made this comment about how industry can learn from government as well, right? Mm -hmm. The tech sector can learn. I mean, is that part of it in your mind? Is this notion that, I might make the argument that the tech sector over the last two decades has really focused, as you said, on what people want yeah. to the exclusion of asking the question sometimes, is that a good idea? Right. Are there societal harms from that? Um, you know, we often talk about trying to recruit tech talent into government. Do you think there's a place to have thoughtful policy folks from government go into the tech sector? Oh, 100%. And actually, to be honest, a bunch of that has happened, um, especially um, when Trump was elected in the U.S., a bunch of Obama uh, policy and, and leadership folks ended up going into tech because they needed somewhere to yeah. go. Um, but I think it's a very healthy back and forth. Um, again, none of this should be one way. It's, it's all bidirectional, and it's all mm. about different communities with different backgrounds really learning from each other and appreciating their other perspective. Yeah.
So tell me a bit about the book. I'm curious, you know, what inspired you to write the book? And, um, you know, if you had kind of a, a list of two or three key messages from here, you would want people should read the book, number one. Yes, but, please. But, 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 <laughs> but, you know, in terms of kind of the Coles Notes version yeah. of, of what, you know, why did you decide to write it? And what do you hope people really take away from it? By the way, you can listen to it, too. The audio book is uh, wonderful. Here is good. Um, yeah, I wrote it in part because I felt like, I kept getting these questions that couldn't be answered in the time, you know, it takes to have a drink at a, at a cocktail party. <laughs> and um, I really I really needed to give the answer the time and space that it really needed. And, um, yeah, I mean, it could have been quite a bit longer, <laughs> actually. You know, it's generally these questions like, well, why isn't this working? You know, um, aren't government public servants must be stupid or lazy if we're getting these outcomes. And I would try to say, no, that's not what's going on. Let me try to explain it. But it just needed that format of like of a deep dive. And frankly, it could have been much deeper dive. Um, and then I realized that, you know, I've spent so long talking to delivery teams, people who are adjacent to delivery teams in government, to people who are considering working in government and um, we've done a lot there, and I think that that general community is trying very hard and doing what it can do. And in order to make more progress, we have to start talking to people who aren't in that community but have influence or power over it. Mm -hmm. They need to see their own role in making government work for people, in bringing policy and delivery together. Um, in, in all of these things uh, that I talk about in the book. And so it's, it's my attempt to, to stop preaching to the choir um, and start converting. <laughs> Yeah, and, and this notion, and you talked about it this morning in your, in your keynote address at, at Ford 50, is that this is everybody's responsibility it at some point. It is everybody's responsibility, yeah. I mean, do you, are you optimistic or pessimistic about where we're at on this kind of digital government transformation right now? Because I'll, I'll be very honest, you know, from my perspective here, and we talk about this yeah. on the podcast often, it kind of feels like we're stuck in the mud right now. Like we've got a sense of where we should be going, but we can't quite seem to get there. And I think a lot of people, especially yeah. types of folks who would be at events like this, are trying to figure out what that is. I mean, does that does that resonate with you? Or do you think that, you know, from the U.S. perspective, do you have a pretty kind of clear path of where things are going? Do you think things are moving in the direction and that at the speed that you'd like them to move? I am getting a sense of frustration here in Canada um, and a sense of stuckness. And I guess what I'm here to say is um, it's always going to feel that way sometimes. But uh, from a U.S. perspective... Certainly, there is not a clear path that makes it sound so easy, and it's never easy. But some stuff has started to click, mm -hmm. and um, our customer service executive order, it's not perfect, no words are magic, but, you know, it's attention on an issue from a higher level of government, you know, yeah. than we've ever seen before. Um, the Even just recently, the executive order on AI was actually quite good. I actually, yep. believe it or not, I don't know if I'm supposed to say this or not, but I got an email from somebody in, in government saying we were reading your book and we hear five things that we tried to do in the EO, you know, make it implementable, not add more, you know, not add more complexity, mm -hmm. not add more layers. Like a lot of the messages in the book, you know, you can start to see coming out in actual policy statements and strategies. Mm -hmm. And, you know, more importantly, um, you know, I have all these teams that I sort of check in with around around federal government, and I I can hear from them, for instance, they were, they were complaining about hiring for a long time. There was a new process for hiring that a USGS team had built, and a team at the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services kept trying to use it. And I would check in and they'd be like, no, it's still not working. Like, it, you know, we're stuck. We're stuck. And then one day they're like, it's working, you know. And that's what happens is, you know, they say, how, did, how do you go bankrupt uh, slowly and then all at once? <laughs> <laughs> um, change can be very slow and then it can start to feel a little bit unstuck. It does not mean, though, that anybody has a glide path on this. There's so much work to be done yeah. in our larger culture. Uh, and I've really come to believe it's not just, you know, convincing uh, ministers or executives or, you know, other, you know, uh, 
in the, in the U.S., you know, legislators, city council people or whatever, it's actually a conversation we need to be having as citizens in our personal hmm. capacities about the role of government and and what we expect of our elected leaders. It has to be different from what we expect of them today. We are so yeah. tied up in this idea of, do you match my values? And I understand that that's important and going to be the first step everywhere. But if we don't go beyond that and say, great, we have a values match. Now I have to understand how you as a leader are going to care about the civil service, care mm -hmm. about implementation, you know, care about these things that our leaders don't think are their jobs right now until we tell them that's their job. They're yep. not going to change. And we as civil servants or people in the civic tech community have to get our friends on board with this. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's a really interesting and important point because I, I often, you know, think certainly in our context, but I see this globally, a lot of the real success stories around digital government are when there's political leadership mm -hmm. that's able to align with the right conditions in the public service to make magic happen. Yep. If I can put it that way. And I think some of the frustration we can get into is when we don't have political leadership that gets this. Yeah. And I think people, you know, kind of bang their head into the wall saying, oh, why can't our politicians be more enlightened? But I think you're making a very important point, which, you know, politicians are kind of the ultimate user researchers. Like they, they respond to what the electorate wants them to do ultimately, right? And, and are driven by those incentives. They res they do. They never get questions about this. They yep. from the from at town hall meetings, from donors, from media, uh, because I think there's some way in which we've bought into this notion that it's not their job. It is their job. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, um, you know, it has become, I mean, technology has become so foundational to everything government does. Mm -hmm. You know, we often talk about in some of the leadership development programs we do that you can't be a modern public service executive if you don't have an understanding of how the digital world works. That's right. And I think that equally applies to elected officials, too. I mean, it's tough to imagine how you're going to effectively lead government if you don't have some conception of how the digital world works. Yeah. And this, by the way, I mean, I think people hear that and they think, oh, we want more programmers and legislatures. No, right. that's not what we're talking about. Um, I would actually say it's, uh, I think, a way to frame it that is less scary is that we just want them involved in implementation. Right. Because implementation is digital. They're going to have to. Yep. But, but I think, you know, part of what happens is people hear, oh, they expect me to be a digital leader. I don't know anything about technology. I'm going to look stupid. I'm let me let me um, resist that frame. Whereas if it's look, you're saying you care about this policy. It's important to you. So you're going to pass mm -hmm. a law or whatever. Do you care about the actual outcome or do you just care about getting the words made into law? Right. And if we can frame it in that way, we want you to follow through. And we want you to understand that following through and getting that outcome is a matter of supporting the civil service and bringing them together around clear goals yeah. and making sure we can hire people, making sure that people aren't overburdened. So, I mean, I, what I say about state capacity, which is, the you know, the frame that I'm trying to promote and a frame that I hope electeds will buy into is there are really only two ways to improve state capacity. You can have more of the right people doing the right work or you can burden them less. Right now, we're not able to get the people we need, and we're burdening them enormously. And our elected leaders think their job is to mandate more and add more and more on top of them without looking at how much their predecessors and their predecessors going back hundreds of years now yep. have burdened the civil service with rules. We're going to have to start removing instead of adding. It's another way we have to redefine what we want out of our leaders. Remove, don't add. <laughs> well, and, 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 you talk, and you have some examples in the book where you talk about this, right, yeah. where I think, you know, probably good-intentioned yes. legislators. Very well-intentioned. Frustrated usually. probably yes. with the lack of action. Yes. Get very prescriptive in legislation. Yes. And causes implementation problems, you know, down the pipe. You, you actually have a quote in the book where you talk about how culture eats policy. Mm-hmm. 
really resonate with me. I have this um, this graph I use often in presentations called my Pac-Man model. <laughs> Same premise of culture eat strategy. Yes. And my notion is often that incentives eat culture and structures eat everything else. Yes. And, I, and I think very much talking about a similar theme to you are, can you talk about that a bit, that notion of kind of culture eating policy? I think it's a fascinating concept and would love to hear your take on that. Maybe, maybe I'll give an example of it from the book. Um, uh, it was it was very clear to me that that was going on when a friend of mine went to work for uh, the well he was working with the USDS but part of the Defense Department and he get, gets asked to go look at this project uh, that's from the Air Force where they're trying to update the software that runs the satellites that enable GPS so not small mm -hmm. <laughs> kind of a big deal and this thing is way 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 behind schedule and way 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 over budget. And he comes in and he sees that there's, you know, very simple way to get the data from the satellites to the ground stations. It's a kind of the standard, you know, uh, simple protocol, uh, universal data pro datagram protocol. This is the obvious way to do it. Um, but somehow in the middle of it, they've stuck this giant Rube Goldberg machine of software um, mm -hmm. in the form of an enterprise service bus. And he's like, well, obviously, you know, What's happening, of course, is the data is timing out before it can get to the ground stations. It's got to go through all this craziness. And he's like, well, we'll just take this out. And they said, well, we can't. It's a requirement from the Air Force to the contractor. And so we have to do it. So he goes and pulls the thread on that. Why is it a requirement? Well, because it's in the Air Force enterprise architecture. Why is it there? Because it's in the Department of Defense enterprise architecture. Mm -hmm. Why is it there? Because it's in the federal enterprise architecture. Why is the federal enterprise architecture exist? Because Congress asked the CIO Council to write a plan for uh, sort of tell agencies how to do government, you know, government mm -hmm. technology better. So you have this intention of better government technology, but because an enterprise service bus is mentioned in one of these documents. Truly, if you look at it closely, just as an example, yep. it's not mandated. It has gotten incrementally more codified and sort of baked in to to become like an actual real requirement down, you know, as it has descended through the hierarchy. And now they can't get rid of it. Um, they feel like it's, you know, it's sort of written into law. Of course, it's not written into law, but it's become yep. so. And it's just one of many examples where you see a, um, a legislative intent of let's make something better that ends up making something worse. And what's happening in between that is a culture where at every level that it's stepped down from Congress to this team at Raytheon in Aurora, mm -hmm. Colorado, trying to update the software, every person interpreting what came to them from above is taking a maximalist rigid interpretation. Yep. And th that's a culture of risk aversion, which flips the intent of the policy. And once you see that, it's funny because I've had people call me and tell me this, like, once you see that pattern, you will see it everywhere. <laughs> and, you know, then people say, so obviously we need to update policy. Well, if <laughs> your policy is going to get eaten by the culture, right. maybe what you need to work on is the culture. Yep. And the incentives and the behaviors and the reasons people are choosing that rigid maximalist interpretation. Yeah. I mean, to have some sympathy for elected officials, they're essentially working with one or both hands tied behind their back because they are trying to have certain directions happen. And as you said, the culture is not letting them be able to turn the knobs on the machine to be yeah. able to get there. So there's on this kind of topic around, I guess, how we translate, you know, democratic democratically elected officials who are kind of giving direction to the civil service. Mm -hmm. Clearly, there's a theme of let's let the implementers implement. Yes. Let's value their work. Let the policy folks essentially support them mm -hmm. rather than see themselves different. I do wonder, and there's been interesting conversations around as we kind of move in this world of agile and, you know, human-centered or user-centered design. I'm a big believer in that. But there's an argument that it almost kind of runs counter to our traditional notion of democratic governments, right? Where there's this notion of we have elected officials whose job it is to make decisions and set policy, mm -hmm. and then public servants just implement. But what we're actually saying is the implementers have a huge important role in this yes. to be able to understand the nuance of the public will and give them some discretion to be able to move on that. 
Do you have any thoughts on what this actually kind of means for our broader political system? I mean, do we, you know, in the, in the early days yeah. of like the Web 2.0 mm-hmm. revolution, I was always a big fan of uh, Beth Simone Novak's book, uh, yeah. Wiki Government, you know, which really yeah. kind of thought about, can we think about Wikipedia as a model and it applies to government? And I kind of feel those conversations have stalled out a little bit, but I think it's still, from my mind, a relevant question of, you know, are our systems of democratic governance that were set up hundreds of years ago, are they still fit for purpose in 2023? You're, you're bringing up some some big media issues. And I think one of them is that this conversation about sort of bureaucratic culture and the gap between policy and outcomes does exist in a political context. And it's a very complicated political context. So I've had a lot of people say to me, you know, well, obviously, the, you know, the reason services don't work is that some, you know, in the U.S., they'll just say one party over the other doesn't want to see them work. And it is absolutely true that there are times that administrative burden, for instance, is used as a weapon to co- cobble a service. It is also absolutely true that a lot of times that is not why mm-hmm. a service works, that we have shot ourselves in the foot. And you, you can't look at California, the state where I live, and not conclude that. I mean, it's a blue as you get. There's some red areas in the rural, you know red rural areas, but um, this is a very pro-welfare ideology, and yet you have poor outcomes. You have, for example, you know, when we started uh, working on SNAP, Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Mm -hmm. Benefit, um, in 2013, 2014 in California, um, through, this was through Code for America, California was the second worst state for participation rate in the country. Wow. The bluest state has the lowest participation rates. That is not intentional. It's, yeah. it's, it's the result of a whole bunch of dynamics that are, again, not, they're, they're very well-intentioned mm-hmm. that have the outcome that you don't want. So, A, I think this idea that it clearly falls around party lines is, is misguided and, and, frankly, a little lazy. Um, I will say also that to the degree that which, sure, we do have some intentional interference, I don't know what to do about that, but I do know what to do about what's not intentional. Mm. And we ought to work. We we shouldn't let the thing that could happen keep us from doing the work that we can do. Um, I also think, honestly, that there are a bunch of people who either formerly or now still identify as Republicans who are very interested in this concept of state capacity, who see the dangers to our country of not being able to do what we say we're going to do. And, you know, there's a much more complicated political, I think, response to the book than most people realize. And I think that's actually really healthy. Yeah, I mean, I'd like to say that, you know, digital is a nonpartisan issue Mm -hmm. at its core. Right. Every stripe of government at the end of the day wants citizens to have better services. Hopefully they run effectively. Hopefully they run efficiency. The emphasis might be a little bit different. Yeah. You know, but the core bit about, as you said, state capacity or having a well-functioning government. Yeah. I mean, it, it having a poorly functioned government stops any administration from being able to implement the policies that it, that it has been elected to do and that it wants to be able to do. Yeah, and I, we're never going to get rid of the messiness of democracy. We're mm-hmm. never like fixing implementation doesn't suddenly make our ability to pass laws in a bipartisan way somehow yep. perfect. Um, but it it is actually just the work that we can do together across party lines that I that I hope we do. And you know the the work behind this. I mean, do you think it is jurisdictional specific? And what I mean by that is you know, you've worked obviously in the U.S. at the federal level, yeah. at state level, you know, you've done local work. Um, I mean, for people who are listening to this who might be kind of embedded in a municipal government somewhere or in a provincial government somewhere, do you think there are kind of common playbooks that they can run to try and move things forward? Or is a lot of this really dependent upon the context of their particular jurisdiction and and kind of the the culture of that particular spot? Uh, Both. (laughs) Um, There is something in common, I think, with, you know, every jurisdiction that's trying to overcome its legacy. Um, And I think there's some core attributes that are helpful. Um, But in the end of the day, you know, people trying to make that change 
there's there's just no clear roadmap that you follow that's like step one, step two. You right. you have to just figure out how to find your allies, make the case, change the conversation, um, and, uh, and, and make progress. Um, I do think that we're seeing more and more, and, 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 and I give, an, I think, a good role model in the book with this um, 26-year veteran of the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. She's in sort of chapters 10, 11, 12. Mm-hmm. Uh, her name's Yadira Sanchez, of, of somebody who, A, you know, doesn't come from the outside, um, she uses energy from the outside. She uses sort of the USDS team that's um, – some of them are from outside government, some of them are from inside government, but just outside CMS who come in with some different ideas about how to do things. Mm-hmm. She uses that. But the change that happens in that agency comes really, I think, first and foremost from her. And I think really often we forget as change agents that our job is to empower others. I think that's a principle that – is probably going to be useful no matter where you are. And I think Yadira, as a role model herself, she really gets out of her lane. You know, she's told you got to do this. And she says, I don't think we should do that. Here's why. And she Mm -hmm. does that over and over again. People throw at her, you know, very complex regulations. And she says, she and her, her colleague Natalie say, I get that it's complicated, but it has to make sense to a person. And let's go back at that. And that's not what delivery people are supposed to do. They're mm-hmm. supposed to fulfill the requirements someone hands them. But she does this sort of incredibly persistent and effective constant pressure towards what she knows is going to be right for users. And she does it in a way that's extremely respectful, very, very, very humble, Um and ultimately grounded in empathy and respect for her peers. She's, mm-hmm. she's not coming in as a disruptor. She's incredibly disruptive <laughs> in yep. what she succeeds in doing, but she doesn't come in to disrupt. She's the yep. anti-disruptor. And, and there's really, I think, something that I learned. Uh, I learned a lot from her in how powerful she was and yet how quiet and humble she was. It's, I mean, it's a really important lesson because I think sometimes – you know, digital teams can get a bad rap that they're the cool kids, right, who are mm-hmm. coming in and, you know, nobody knows what they're doing and we're going to kind of shake it up. And that notion of having empathy not just for your users but for your colleagues yeah. to be able to shift that is is really powerful. And I, I thought that was a really good story from the book and, and you had talked about that earlier today as well. And, uh, and I don't mean that teams aren't going to need to shake things up. Yep. You are. But, you know, I think if it's always in the service of empowering others – you are going to be far more sustainable than if your yes. team is trying to succeed. You want others to succeed. Yes, absolutely. Um, I did want to also ask you about Code for America because, you know, we, we've we occasionally talked a little bit about civic technology on this show. Not a ton, though. Um, and you had this unique experience of, of standing up and leading Code for America, major civic tech organization in the U.S., Curious if you could maybe just talk a little bit about, you know, what civic tech means to you, mm-hmm. uh, you know, what Code for America's kind of purpose was, and and how you think that civic technology groups or communities can be part of the solution we're talking about. Yeah. Um, I haven't been with Code for America three years, um, but I think it's still, you know, on the same journey, essentially. You know, it somewhat reflects my own <laughs> journey. Civic tech has never had a good definition but, it, you know, and, and initially it sort of meant um, outsiders working with open data, um, you know, this very focused on transparency. Mm-hmm. And then over time, Code for America, at least, and I think the civic tech label maybe traveled with it, went inside and said, you know, we are um, uh, Code for America employees aren't, aren't state employees or city employees, but they're working side by side. Right. Um, on services that the state or city delivers, not, you know, uh, an application that we, you know, are offering to the public as, you know, using open data, Mm -hmm. for instance. So it kind of went from the outside into the inside, and I think it carried some of the same ethos along with it. Um, And so I think some people are asking, what's the role of the insiders? What's the role of the people who kind of have one foot in and one foot out? Mm -hmm. And then what's the role of the outsiders? And I think, you know, to take each of those a little bit separately, I'll, I'll start with the the outsiders. 
I think the kind of work that outside groups need to do has changed a lot. Mm -hmm. And there's actually a ton of opportunity, especially if you think not just in the um, framework of civic tech, but in the framework of state capacity. Like, what can we be doing? I'll I'll speak to the U.S. where we have this Inflation Reduction Act, you know, passed at the federal level, gigantic bill, one of three gigantic bills. And, you know, one of it's one of the big things it's trying to do is to decarbonize our economy so that we can avoid a climate mm-hmm. climate collapse. Is there anything more important out there? I don't know, right? But enormous number of things have to happen at the local level for it to succeed that the feds cannot and will not really pay attention to. Right. They can't see it, right? Like so if anybody ever worked on a Code for America project, think about how cities permit residential solar or permit the installation of a heat pump. Mm -hmm. That is not a frictionless project (laughs) or process. Anyone who's done it is about about going, yeah, that was so hard, so much harder than it needed to be, right? In Australia, you get, uh, you want a permit to put solar on your house. There's a little app you, on your phone, you fill it out and it emails you the permit immediately. Mm -hmm. And then yeah, there's compliance stuff. It's all on the contractor, but it is frictionless yeah. to to get that. We don't have that. And we don't have the capacity from the feds or from philanthropy to go in and fix, you know, there's 30,000 local ju- jurisdictions in the U.S., all of whom should hopefully have the problem of, you know, twice to 10 times as many requests for permits of this kind, and they need to speed that up. I mean, it's just one example. Yep. Isn't isn't that a great service design challenge that outside groups could help them with? Couldn't they be showing up at City Hall and saying, what are you guys doing about your capacity to permit solar? You know, yep. th- there's so many things that people can be doing now that maybe don't look exactly like the, you know, the 2010s when we were doing the open data stuff, but are in, like literally critical to the country's survival. So I hope that spirit not just persists, but actually, you know, grows. Yeah. And that's, I mean, in some ways, that's the exciting thing, as you're saying, is you don't have to be a career civil servant to affect change on this, yeah. right? The, you know, the, the the revolution that the web brought us in some ways democratized technology in a way yeah. that there's more entry points into shaping that public policy environment. And we're at a point where there is so much policy to be implemented. Yes. Like, there's, the world's know, more complex. And we've, at least in the U.S., we have just, you know, we have just swallowed three elephants in <laughs> the Inflation Reduction Act, the Infrastructure Act, um, and the Chips and Science Act. And, you know, I think it should be a whole of government and whole of nation effort to implement those things. I don't really want to hear about new legislation anymore. I want to hear about the implementation of what's on our plate right now. Absolutely. Um, Jennifer, this has been fascinating as, as we kind of wrap the conversation up. You know, in your book, you dedicate it to public servants everywhere with the message of don't give up. Mm-hmm. So if there is a public servant listening to this and they are thinking of giving up, mm-hmm. what what message would you give to them to, to hold on to hope? I'm so glad you asked that. Um, you are not alone. You are actually, if you are feeling like you want to give up, that is because you are a human with deep feelings, which means you're a good person. Mm-hmm. And this is just a sign that you are alive. And so many people have been in your position before, and what kept them going is what they reached out. They reached out to someone else who's been through it. It's incredibly emotional serving the public. It's so hard, and it takes so much of you. And the only way you get through it is by asking for help from others. And so if you're here at Forward 50, there's a ton of people around for you to reach out to. But if you're not, you just got to put that bat signal out because – everyone will recognize what you're feeling and be able to support you. Wonderful last words. Thanks so much, Jennifer, for the time. This has been a great conversation. Thank you. It's delightful. I want to thank Jennifer for taking time out of her busy schedule to talk to us. I really enjoyed her book. And if you're listening to or watching this podcast, I know you'll love it too. 
be sure to check out the show notes for a link to purchase Recoding America. And I'm excited to let you know that this week we have a special giveaway for our listeners. Anyone who has signed up for our newsletter mailing list by next Friday, December 22nd, will be eligible for a random drawing for a copy of Jennifer's book, just in time for your holiday reading list. Go to letsthinkdigital.ca to sign up or look for details in the show notes for today's episode. And that's the show for this week. So what did you think? Did you see your experience reflected in some of the anecdotes that Jennifer told? Let us know. Email us at podcast at thinkdigital.ca or use the hashtag Let's Think Digital on social media. If you're watching this on YouTube, make sure to like and subscribe. And if you're listening to us on your favorite podcast app and you liked this episode, be sure to give us a five-star review afterwards. And remember to go to letsthinkdigital.ca and sign up for our newsletter and catch up on past episodes of the podcast. Today's episode of Let's Think Digital was produced by myself, Wayne Chu, and Aislinn Bournet. Thanks so much for listening, and let's keep thinking digital.